Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to run this just like class. I don't think you're going to hide there. <laughs> I have been teaching at the University of Michigan for 36 years. So <laughs> um, and the tools I'm about to show you are, came out of the fact that basically I was trying to find ways to engage students, particularly in the large intro courses, where it's quite a dead zone often in terms of any kind of active learning or engagement of students. And by the end of the day, and the thing you might want to tweet if you're going to, is that we're going to show you that it is possible that by week two or three of your class, you're going to be able to identify who's going to fail using simple student behaviors. That is, how students behave in class it has, gives you a great deal of information about how students are going to perform in your course. And I'm going to show you uh, what I, the tools that I use. And also today, I'm going to be showing you how I collect the data from Canvas, as well as the data from Echo 360, which uh, allows me to do engagement in the classroom. Those two data sets merged give you a powerful data set that allow you to do these sort of analytics. So uh, the title is about Fitbit for the classroom. This says, is Fitbit is there simply as an analogy. That is a Fitbit, I'm not going to, the booth apparently is handing out Fitbit, not handing out, they have a drawing for a Fitbit, go, you, go get one. But my interest is, like a Fitbit, if we could measure everything, in fact, next slide should say this, yeah. What if you knew everything your students were doing during class? How does that help you? And how does that help the student? Or how does it help the advisor for the student? That's the question I'm raising to you today and we'll talk about it as part of this presentation. Now, often I as the instructor or an advisor, any advisors in the room? Oh, one of you at least, good. I'll speak just to you, sir. Because <laughs> as an advisor, and stop me if I'm wrong, but you have some information available to you. I as the instructor have some information available to me and I might include things about the students grades that they're having in other courses, and might something about their background that they have, where they're coming from, maybe their grade point coming into the class. Uh, we might know something about the goals of the student, that this student wants to major in psychology or other information about that student. I'm arguing that's not enough. It's not enough for me as an instructor necessarily, it's not enough for advisors, definitely. So the whole idea is how do we expand the amount of information that we can gather from the students' activities in the classroom. And Canvas and Echo 360 allow you to do that in spades. First of all, one of the things I, my feeling is that students' ability to learn is going to be affected to some degree by wellness factors. That is, how do they feel? So I have started asking my uh, students in class every day um, a graph like this, how do you feel today? emotionally and physically. And the students can put a dot on the map and indicate how they feel. And you can see that there's a quite a collinearity there between the physical and emotional state. By the way, I asked them, and that the, first of all, they have to give their permission in order to do this. I don't want to just be gathering this data uh, without their permission. Uh, but I think I can mine this data over the course of the semester using a question like this and see the trajectory of how they feel and how physically they're working over the semester. And I use that for my research to understand to what degree these factors uh, affect student learning. Now, I'm not going to speak about that today. I'm happy to talk about it outside of this. Uh, but I, this is the kind of data we might want to start looking at because while there was no relationship between their physical state and grades, in fact, the only relationship in Ann Arbor was between the minimum temperature and their physical state. The colder it got, the worse they felt. Uh, their emotional state actually is related to their grades. Should we be collecting that? Should we even know that? Well, that's a whole other conversation I wouldn't mind having. So that's one factor. And the other factor I'm interested in is basically what is the student doing? I'm conducting class, and I'm not using, I'm not doing a, let me talk about my class. I don't do a flipped class yet. I'm, I'm old. <laughs> and I'm teaching a more or less traditional way, but trying to make the class more interactive by posing questions during class so the students understand more what they don't understand. And by doing that, I'm able to measure their, their, their uh, understanding of the material as we go through. And from what they're, as I'll show you in a moment, the students are going to be engaged in their laptops doing a variety of tasks during class. 
and I'm measuring everything they do. On day one, I tell you, I'm putting a probe in you. It may not be comfortable, and I'm going to measure <laughs> over the course of the semester what you're doing. And if you're uncomfortable with that, uh, you can you know, click and, and opt out or take a different course. But only you know, eight out of uh, 250 students will do that. Most are happy to play along. And I'm able to collect uh, information about their behaviors during class. And their behaviors during class are, are unusually uh, instructive. Now, the kinds of things that students can do, of course, uh, is before class, maybe you have them read material, view material, uh, video if you're flipping your class, uh, maybe answer some questions, do homework, uh, maybe pose some questions. These are the things they might do during, before class. During class, they're going to listen, maybe. They're going to take notes, uh, answer questions. If I pose some, they might pose questions back to me. Uh, they might reflect on what I'm saying, and undoubtedly they're going to get confused. I'm teaching my courses extreme weather. I'm happy to say I'm a meteorologist at this meeting with a beautiful sky outside. <laughs> After class, they reflect on their notes, and they might again pose questions. There's a variety of things that students are doing as a natural part of participating in my course, or in my many courses. And what I'm able to do is measure to what degree they do these, when they do these things, how much of this they do, and does any of that matter? Which of these factors relates then to their learning, to their grades they're going to get in the class? So what I'm going to talk about today is the fact that I'm trying to measure these student behaviors using the variety of tools, Echo and Canvas. I join the data sets together and dragging down the data from Canvas, getting the data from Echo, merging them into one, one group. Uh, and look for relationships. What is it the students are doing that is, impacts their grades? And from that, trying to build prescriptive models so that I could potentially identify students at risk much earlier. Many of our early warning systems are based on the grades they get on the first exam. That is too late. You've got to find the students earlier in the semester. And this allows me, even in the first couple of weeks, to identify the weaker students. What to do with them, that's a whole other conversation we'll have later. And then figure out how to give, that, give some feedback back to the student, which actually has some, some value to it for the student. Oh, oh, the, that point was simply that if I do this, so, so in this, the beauty of this system is that I can do some kind of feedback, some intervention. If I see a student who I think is, is in trouble, I can do some kind of intervention and actually measure in real time, did they change their behaviors? based on intervention. So this gives me a, a great deal more power than I've ever had to try to follow how students respond to my guidance. Uh, so that's measuring behaviors. The next, and part of the measuring behaviors is I use this tool from Echo 360. And it does a variety of things. This is what the, this is what the student uses in class. And in class, they can view my slides. I hit a button, I upload my slides into their system. The students now have access to my slides, to the videos I show during class, to questions I'll ask during class. They'll have access there in that window. They can take notes over here uh, that are synchronized to the slides. And because Echo also does lecture capture, they are also synchronized to the capture. So later, if the student clicks on this slide, then it will take them to that spot in the video where they took the note a good connection there between for them when they do their study. Um, they can pose, the students wanted this, it was their idea. They wanted to be able to ask me questions, which I found odd after the 30 some odd years I've been teaching, because the students very rarely asked questions. Uh, and I thought, well, why would you want now suddenly to ask questions of me? But I, want to, I want to talk about that for a second. Because I did some research, I asked the students on day one. How comfortable are you asking a verbal question in class? And it might not surprise you that half of the male students said they're comfortable, half did not. But less than a quarter of the female students said they're comfortable. <laughs> so for the past 30 years before this, when I taught class and I'd go, any questions? And that's the response I always get. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Except maybe after I wait long enough, somebody in the front row might feel embarrassed and finally ask a question. So over the course of a year, I might get something like 10 questions submitted, verbally. 
With this system, last semester I had 418 questions submitted. You know how sobering that is? For the previous 30 years, I would ask that any questions or no questions. I figured I'd just nail that course, you know, slam this thing down to the, and do the victory dance because I had just nailed that class and they all got it. And the reality was the students had questions. They just were intimidated to ask them for fear that they would look stupid around there. So by allowing them to do this, not only did I get 418 questions submitted, the females asked far more questions than the male students. Victory. Everyone was able to ask questions comfortably during class. Students from English is not the native language. are asking as many questions as the rest of the students. Victory. Everyone, my job is to make the class <laughs> as in, you know, engaging as possible. Everyone feels like they can participate, and this helps me do that. Now, you may argue that, yes, students should be willing to ask questions verbally. Yeah, they will in their junior year or so, but that freshman year, their first generation students, they come to class, they are not comfortable. They don't even think they belong there yet. They are so uncomfortable that they're not going to go risk taking a question during class. So that button by itself <laughs> is of great value to the students. And for me, because now there's a great deal more interaction going on, they can <coughs> bookmark slides saying, ah, this is going to be on the exam. And then go back and look at which slides they bookmarked to see you know, what to study later on. And this button here says, I have no idea what Perry's talking about. We call it the WTF button. <laughs> I don't know. And they click that, and it indicates on their, in their system which slides they found confusing. And it also sends a signal to me up here in the front of the room so I can see how many students are confused. How about that? We're communicating. My class is 250 students. I should also point out that my class is being using this Echo 360 system. I can click a button, and it's broadcast live. So, so some portion of the students come to class, some portion choose to watch from away, and it's all interactive no matter where you are, and if you're confused no matter where you are, I'll know it. Now, I might still ignore you, <laughs> because after teaching so many years, I have a pretty good idea where you're going to be confused. Nonetheless, I have that data so that after class, I can go back and see which areas were students most confused, and maybe I can help by bringing some new material next time, try to explain it in a different way. Think of other activities we could do. But data, this is all about data. The tool, that's sweet. It's like I'm a meteorologist. I can put more thermometers out here on the mountain, and that's interesting, but you'll pay for the forecast for the weekend. That's what you want. Likewise, this is collecting data that allows me then to forecast who's going to be in trouble. Uh, and it does capture, if there's a camera in the room, it captures me. I'm not sure there's any value in that. <laughs> and there's also capturing what's being projected in the room. So if you're sitting at home, you'd be able to see everything uh, where you, um, as it's going on. If you're watching this after class, you'd have access to that in the capture. <laughs> and the important thing here is not just the capture, but everything that's going on is linked. The notes are linked to the spots in the capture. The student can go back and forth between these systems in one easy way. Any questions so far? Please. So this whole system here that you have that's integrated, that's the 360? Correct, and that sits inside of Canvas. Oh, yes, the question was, does this system uh, I've just presented is an integrated system, and uh, the Echo 360 system, the answer is yes, and it sits inside of it, whatever your LMS is, Canvas for sure and then talks back and forth with Canvas. Anything else? How many students bring laptops and engage in, in this? On, on How many students system? bring their laptops to class? I, this is, by the way, a voluntary system. I tell the students, I show the students this on day one. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, if you don't want to bring a laptop, that's fine. If you forget to bring your laptop, that's fine. You can still take notes on paper and pencil, please do. Uh, when I pose questions in class, you can hand them in on paper. I'll give you credit. <clears throat> 93% uh, bring their laptops every day because they see value. Can yes. they use any other device? Or any device. device. Any device. All right. So here's the kinds of questions now I can pose. This, if you're a teacher, how many instructors do we have in here? God bless you. All right. So you're trying to engage the students. And yeah, you can use clickers, the ABC kind of stuff. That's interesting. And here, for example, is what conditions make the atmosphere less stable? <clears throat> and you can see that most students got it right here. <laughs> but by clicking a button, I can also require the students justify, why did you choose that? 
And now, if I click on the letter B, it'll show me the justification the students had for choosing B. And now we can have a more, more richer conversation. I can see what you were thinking and give you feedback as a student so that you understand why you got it wrong or you got it right. It just allows me more design options in creating my class. Likewise, I love imagery, being a meteorologist. So here's a map of all the hurricanes, tornadoes, I didn't say that, hurricanes, typhoons, and cyclones uh, in the last 50 years, and ask the students what part of this picture does not make sense to you and why. And then the students can vote. And you can see that what, with their, where they're confused, and you know, some of them are like, I asked, what part of this does not make sense to you? you know, why would you put a dot there? <laughs> So I can click on any one of the dots, and I can see why they chose that dot. This opens up class now in a new way. Why are there no storms coming off the coast of South America? Well, there aren't any, are there? It's a superb question. And it leads to a conversation now about why there wouldn't be any hurricanes there in that area. Or why are there no hurricanes around the equator? Is that significant? And this changes the class dynamic, because now the students are actually kind of designing. They're asking the questions, and I'm guiding them through that. Their inquiry leads to discussion in class. It helps you design your course in another way if you choose to. Just more tools for teaching. And the data we get out of this is amazing. <clears throat> so I know how many students, in my case, physically came to class, the dark area, uh, watched from their school residence, the Hannish area, uh, watched from elsewhere, the yellow area, or just blew me off, the gray area, every day. And how do I do that? I simply ask him, question one, where are you? Because there's no loss of credit for not being in class. As long as you're participating, I don't care from where, in my case. So this kind of data at least helps me understand to what degree is watching from a way maybe of less value to you educationally than coming to the classroom. I have information about how many students are taking notes <coughs> every day, <coughs> the dark blue area here, and how many words are each of the active students taking. So I think this tells me something about my teaching, where I see that the lecture on moisture had a lot of students taking notes and a lot of words that they were typing. It must have been either very confusing or ver verbose that day. And over here, air masses in France, other days are taking a lot of notes. Here's a guest lecture. You can see <laughs> the data like you've never seen before about how much are your students engaged during class. That's individual lectures. Okay. Yeah. But not ordered in time. Yes, ordered in time. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. And then your job is to pull these data sets together, and Echo is doing some of this, and Bradley will talk about this in a moment. <clears throat> but we have in, in this Echo system, you get data about, you know, did they look at the lecture capture? When did they look at that? Did they do bookmarks? Did they attend class? Did they pose questions? Everything the students are doing is going into this database. <laughs> and this is uh, the Echo 360 part of the database. Then you have the Canvas part. So the Echo 360 part goes into, in our case, the University of Michigan, going into a central database. We also drag in the data from Canvas <laughs> and from our student information system for background data. And then other vendors all come into this so we can collect the data, and do some real research on what is it the students do that affects their learning. <laughs> now we're going to look for our relationships in this whole process. And the things we see, oh, here's good news for our we instructors. <laughs> you felt, you knew, you hoped this was true, but the more they come to class, or 33 classes in my semester, the more they came to class, the higher the grades they got. <laughs> this could have been really awkward. <laughs> but you have real data that you can then show students. There is value. Here's numerical value right there for why you may want to come to the class. And this, by the way, where I say attendance here, this is attending either remotely or physically face-to-face. -face. On the other hand, you're going to ask the question about remote versus physical. So the students who got above 90... 65% of the time, they came to class. Watched from away, 28% of the time. The students who got less than 70, they only came to class about a quarter of the time. Viewed from away about half the time, or blew, blew off the class about a quarter of the time. That's another graph you want to show the students. You might, you know, 
why, are you, why aren't you coming to class physically? Because there seems to be some value in that. So without the data, you know, what do you, you just tell the students to work harder. What the heck does that mean? You know, you just failed the last exam. Whatever you're doing, do more of it is the wrong answer. We need to be able to give them some more specific information about how they might change their behaviors. Note taking, you may argue taking notes may or may not be important to student learning. There is a relationship. The students who took the most notes did the best on the exams with, with variability there. <laughs> I would argue that's probably a weak measure because some students will take just a few notes and learn a lot and others will try to transcribe everything I say and learn little. But there seems to be some information there again that I can show the students why they might want to be taking notes. Um, this is very important. The percent of questions answered correctly. Now, if you use clickers or you use Echo 360 or whatever, this is such a dumb thing to say. <clears throat> but if you're posing questions in class and the students are getting it right, they're probably going to do well on the exam. <laughs> on the other hand, if they're not getting it right during class, many of them don't take the time or have the wherewithal to figure out how to improve themselves. <laughs> So here becomes your, the basis for your early warning system. Ask a lot of questions. Let them know what they don't know. Let you know what they don't know. And this gives you the basis from which you can now make some pr 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 predictions about student success in the classroom. So the students have got more than 60% of my questions right. They got average 93. Whoa. I mean, my questions were not easy. And the students that got less than 30% right, hey, average 68. So a clear indication, again, show the students this and, or, or let the students see how they're doing compared to their peers in the class, that they might understand that they have to do some more work. And certainly the advisors ought to see that. This is the first time I think anybody's tried this stunt. I sucked in all the data from Canvas and the data from Echo 360, said, all right, of these various measures I can get from the various systems, what is related to grades? And I've tried to indicate here, over here, I can do this pointer thingy, on the side, those which are Echo 360-like, the activity is correct. How, what percent of correct questions do they get correct during class? And you see that by far indicates most of the mean square error in the student grades. That explains a great deal of variance in the student grades. How much do they view the slides during class? We measure everything. Did you look at all the slides? How much time lag between when I change the slide and you change your slide? All kinds of measures that we have in the system. And all these help predict the highest order here are these. And then the yellow ones down here, some of the canvas, they, how often do they go to the files menu, how often they use external tools, et cetera, uh, come into play. But the key here is measuring what students do during class. And that's the part that this Echo 360 system does for us, is why I built this lecture tools in the first place, which became this, was because this tool does what, you, what the LMS was not doing. It was a tool I could use during class. And the measures I'm getting back help me understand uh, student success far, far more in the classroom. Another measure that many of you are probably very familiar with <coughs> is we can often predict students' grades based on their incoming grade point average. And this is a bit disheartening. It means the students who come in with a low grade point are bound to do poorly on the exam. That means I am doing nothing for that student. Somehow I'm not motivating that student to do well. And this relationship shows up in course after course. So what we looked at is turn the question around. How is it that student behavior varies as a function of their incoming grade point? That is, the weaker students, do they simply behave in a different way? And lo and behold, the students with a lower, with a higher grade point, they average, they act, <clears throat> answer some 85% of my questions on average. The students with a low grade point only at, at answer about 65% of my questions. So the dramatic difference there is simply how students participate in class. As a, so it's not that they're necessarily cognitively weaker. It's just they're behaving in a way that doesn't allow them to be successful. 
I can see how much of the lecture captures the view after class. Well, the students, it's a 50 minute class. The students with a high grade point average some 22 minutes per class <coughs> reviewing the lecture. The students with a low grade point, that's a one. That means they probably went to that site by accident thinking it was ESPN. So, oh my God, it's class, and got out as quickly as they could. <laughs> so dramatic differences there in how these students behave uh, as a function of incoming grade point. This one, note taking. The students with a high, I think this is words per class. The students with a high grade point, 130 words per class of notes. The students with a low grade point, that's two two orders of magnitude difference in note taking, just dramatic differences. Again, these are data that the I or the advisors now can use with these students. You're coming to my class with a low grade point. If you behave this way, you're going to do poorly. Real data, hopefully the data would motivate the student to change their behaviors. That's, that's yet to be proven. My goal is to be able to show the students real data that they would change their behaviors. <clears throat> This was eye-opening to me. This is the students with a high grade point physically come to class what, 65, you know, 70% of the time, watch from away maybe 20% you know, of the time, and don't come to class a small amount. Students with a low grade point never came to class. Watch from away half the time, blew off the class half the time. <laughs> and you fail the course? Duh. I mean, we, this is data that the advisors should know about. Stop me if I'm wrong, should, they should have access to this kind of data so that when Johnny walks in, they can look up to Johnny and say what Johnny is doing and, and yell at them or whatever you do, slap them. I don't know what you do in there. <laughs> 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 Better advising techniques. <laughs> Something has to happen, and, I, and it's got to be, yes, it could be the instructor, but it also the advisors need to be tied into this whole process. Any questions about this so far? These charts? No, I, I did this in PowerPoint. No. But you're asking, does, does Echo provide a dashboard which has this kind of information? The answer is not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but ask me again in the fall. Any others? Sir. Yeah, when the students answer the question, they will see whether they got it right or not. Yeah. I mean their overall numbers. You're asking, I think, is there a student dashboard where they can see how they're at? Not yet. Again. Doing for like the whole course. Yeah, that, that's coming also. <coughs> coming soon. Okay. And also in a dashboard for the advisors who would have access to this as well. But the important thing here is data. And somehow this data needs to flow to those, those populations. Uh, and yes, we need dashboards to do that. Um, but let's get that data flowing, combine it with Echo, and, and we'll s talk about in a moment, Echo 360 and Canvas now working together to, to share these data. Quick show of hands, who thinks this dashboard's a good idea? <laughs> 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 yeah. Make him work. <laughs> Make that man work. And then you build prescriptive models. All right, here's the model I used last semester in my class. It's really, this is the first generation and stupid model. Don't write this down. Mileage will vary. <laughs> this is the fraction they correct during the first two or three weeks of the class. How many questions I'm asking are they getting correct? And that, that was a predicting, <clears throat> prediction of their exam scores. We've become more sophisticated now in our pr predictive schemes where we take in not only this, but other factors, including the Canvas data. And the combination over the first two or three weeks and now allows us to do this. <coughs> this is for all the courses at the University, I want to repeat this. This is for all the courses at the University of Michigan. We're now able to predict with some 70%, 77% accuracy whether the student's going to fail the course or not by week three. And for me, this is, this is, this is you know, I'm almost, almost worried about saying that because it just <laughs> makes me nervous that it's that, that accurate. But the potential there is that you could grab students who are going to fail and do something. <laughs> Advisor? We'll do something together. Somehow we have to come up with strategies for how we present these data to the student in a way that motivates them to change their behavior. But the fact that we can do this now gives me hope 
that we can, we need an earlier warning system. Well, here's an earlier warning system. Now what do we do? And this is where I'm looking for guidance and help and your thoughts about what we might do. So here's my simple solution to this. And don't laugh at me. The, I identified 20 students who are going to fail. And, and my solution was to take them out for coffee one at a time to hear the stories. What's going on? And they appreciated this. You know, they, I'm not sure to help with their grades yet or not. We're going to do that research in the fall. But just taking them out for coffee to hear the stories, to be, you know, my, it's my job, is to help students succeed. And if simply taking them out for coffee helps, then great. But at least this way I'm hearing the stories of the students, understanding the, maybe the other challenges they have in their lives. Um, and I think they do that thinking I'm going to be empathetic and lenient. <laughs> that is so cute. <laughs> the point is you would have this, the op opportunity to take them out for coffee or to do whatever intervention you think is necessary. And then ultimately we need to share these results because, yeah, I've got this data. Uh, Echo has this data. You'll have this data. Somehow we need to motiv moderate the student behaviors, <laughs> report them out, create some feedback for that student, either myself or the advisor or a combination, <clears throat> and communicate that to the student. And again, the power of this is you do that. You do that intervention. And then from that day on, you can see whether it worked. Because you'll be able to measure from that time stamp on, did the student change their behaviors in any way? And so you don't need a control group anymore. You're going to have the student, you're going to change, you offer them an intervention and see what the change is in the classroom. <laughs> That's the great potential here. And at this point, I'd like to pass the baton to Bradley Ford, and he's the guy who actually makes this system work, so be nice to him. <laughs> <laughs> now you have to be nice. Thanks, Perry. Great clear. All right, so what I want to talk about today is we've got a great partnership with Instructure where we are now bringing the Canvas LMS data into the system as well. And we're doing that automatically, so you don't have to worry about how do I get it out of Canvas, how do I normalize it, how do I put it in a reasonable place, so we're doing all of that for you. We really are starting now with a focus group, so we have a number of our customers in the focus group helping us decide what data is you know, most useful, less useful, and what kind of order we want to do these things in. The first thing that we're rolling out is this correlation report. And what it lets you do is take any of those behavioral metrics that Perry was talking about and see student by student how does that impact score. So we're taking the Canvas uh, current score in section number out and you can plot that against the calculated engagement score where in Echo 360 you can decide for your section how important are each of these you know, components in the final engagement score and we'll calculate a weighted average. You can also look at each one individually. So how many notes did they take? How many bookmarks did they take? And you can see, you know, was there a good positive correlation between those engagement metrics and their score to date? And in most cases, we see that there really is. We're also looking at, can we automatically calculate the highest correlated engagement score for you so that we could tell you what these should be set to to get the highest correlation? Make sense? This is one report of many. I mean, we're bringing over all the Canvas data and we're starting to figure out what else do we want to do. Um, it'll be a, a pretty robust offering. Um, but that's the integration between Canvas and Echo. All right. If you'd like to join the advisory group, uh, please email Bill Holding. He's our product management head or myself. Uh, I run the technology group. I'm the CTO. And we'd be happy to get you involved. We also have some leave behinds that we'll have available for you as you're walking out so that you can take something with you if you want to take something with you. Any questions? Yes? Yes, yes we have. Um, not there yet, but, but we've definitely thought about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, have we thought about carrying this out further in time, like to graduation rates? All of that data gets retained, so as we roll it up inside the institution, so if you deploy ECHO 360 institution-wide, then you would have it for every year, for every section, for every student. And so the data's there, but doing that kind of reporting, we don't have yet. How old is the product? 
The product is two years old. Yes. Uh, Echo 360 is about 10 years old. We were the ones who invented lecture capture at scale. So it's easy to capture 100 rooms, not no big challenge. Capturing 1,000 rooms is tough. You know, we, we do that very well. This is the active learning platform, yes. Yes. Uh, there's actually two ways of doing it. Uh, one is for number of active student users. The other way is for site license, and we really probably have to talk to you to figure out what, which one makes sense. But you can do a site license not for the entire institution. If you wanted to do one school or one department, we can talk about that too. Sorry? We can't question like that because we're down in the Yes, we are, absolutely. Good point. Yes? Uh, really, any demographic data that you want to collect, you can create one of our questions and ask. Um, we're not ingesting SIS data, so we're, we're not going to get that for you automatically. Yes? Uh, much more robust question types. So you can do a lot of things that you couldn't do with the clicker, like some of the things that Perry was showing you. Um, also, it's fully integrated, which there's real power in that, because by knowing you know, what you were doing in a class and when you were doing it and what topic were you talking about when the student was doing these activities, it's very, very useful. <coughs> yes, uh, so we support pretty much any kind of device. Um, so it's, we don't see too much of an issue with that. Um, and as Perry said in his class, he lets people opt out if that were the situation, but it's a very small number. Um, if you have a laptop, tablet, or smartphone, you'd be good. Didn't you say that, that, that they could not come to class and still participate, though? Yes, but you would need a device. So I think the question was, if I don't have a laptop, then you couldn't live stream from a remote location. You would need, you would need some kind of device. Else? Yes. <laughs> That's what I was having in my pocket. So smile more often. No, looking at the data, I mean, sort of those folks who hang on to face-to-face classes matter. Because right now I'm only teaching 100 percent online because I'm on leave to be director of our talk center, and I just face-to-face is so much richer than online because I don't think I'm the best online teacher, and your data kind of supports that face. -to -face at least when you give them the alternative. So are you considering taking this data and expanding it to, to start doing that comparative analysis? Yeah, again, given uh, uh, I'm in my final years. <laughs> and so I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> <laughs> So I, I would work with people who do the, face, uh, the online learning. Uh, and in fact, I'm open, by the way, to anybody who wants to do research uh, with these and work with you on doing, doing the research. So I'm fascinated by how would this work if it was just an online environment. Uh, mine is a, this hybrid thing, and I'm, I'm seeing that I worry, in fact, that the students who are choosing not to physically come to class, that we're actually creating a, an option for mediocrity by doing that. So online, when it's just online, I, that wouldn't be an issue as much. But how I have a hard time with online. I'll be honest. Online learning, I, if, if I'm sitting at home and listening to a webcast or something, the refrigerator is calling my name, and I, I, I've got to be there. So it's hard for me to focus, and I'm thinking probably that's true for many. So it's an area of research. So let me just make a couple of comments. Echo 360 really is a platform, right? So many of these tools get applied different ways and different kinds of pedagogies, and that's fine. That's what we intend. Um, we do have dashboards that expose the data. We have a way to download the data in CSV. Um, we don't have the rich dashboards that we talked about we're working on now. And our institution is using your product for synchronous online learning? Yes. Um, synchronous, asynchronous, flipped classroom, uh, hybrid, uh, course overflow, if you can't get enough people in the same physical room, all those things. The question is, do I also break it down by year? I've not done that. Uh, that's a good question. But there's just so much data that 
Uh, if you want to look at that, I'm happy to share the data. <laughs> Thank all right. you all very much for your time. Thank you.